Hi, I'm Kelly Cervantes, and this is Seizing Life, a weekly podcast produced by Citizens United for Research in Epilepsy, CURE. Today, I'm excited to welcome Kim and Mike Adamley to the podcast. Football fans may remember Mike from his playing days at Northwestern University and his six years in the NFL from 1971 through 1976. You may also recognize Mike from his long and successful career as a broadcaster and sports anchor. He worked for NBC Sports, ESPN, and American Gladiators, among many others in his nearly 40-year career. Mike has suffered from epilepsy for more than 20 years, and in 2017, he was diagnosed with dementia. At the same time, his doctor reported signs of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, a degenerative brain disease found in athletes, military veterans, and others with a history of repetitive brain trauma. Mike and his wife Kim have founded the Adam Lee Project to provide patients and families living with symptoms of CTE with tools, resources, and a supportive community. They are here today to talk about living with post-traumatic epilepsy and CTE. Kim, Mike, thank you so much for joining us today and talking about this incredibly important topic that is just not getting enough airtime out there, and that is this connection between epilepsy and CTE, the, the chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And in your case, Mike, this is as a result of years of playing football. Um, you have had an incredible career and this amazing life playing. You know, you played football with the likes of Walter Payton and Joe Namath and and, um, and, and started your career here in Chicago at Northwestern as an All-American. Um, my father was very excited to hear that I was getting to chat with you today. Uh, tell me one or two or some of your favorite memories that you have from playing football. Most of the favorite memories are the, the time spent with the guys that you played with, you know. Uh, you forge relationships that last you not five years, not ten years, but for the rest of your life. You know? uh, we had a group of guys at Northwestern my senior year. We finished like uh, second in the Big Ten, only behind Ohio State. And back then, you either went to the Rose Bowl or No Bowl. So, uh, but we've all stuck together for the last 50 years, believe it or not. I mean, we... we uh, we go to games and we sit on a guy's back porch that we used to play with and uh, we call ourselves the hard bodies, even though, <laughs> even though we're not so hard anymore. Uh, so I, I mean, I, I played there for four years. I got drafted by the Chiefs. I played there for two years, got traded to the Jets. I was there with Namath and uh, played there for years and then got traded to the Bears. My, my last three years were Walter's first three years. So. Fortunately, or not so unfortunately, between the 76 and 77 seasons, I had tore my leg water ski jumping part, part tore, tore away. I mean, it wasn't in your contract that you weren't allowed to it do that? It wasn't in our contract. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it wasn't. You were, you were I, I, I think I was making about $35,000, $40,000 at the time, but he, Jim Finks, who was the general manager back then, he said, you know, you really freaking pissed me off. I, yeah, I said, you know what? Because we were really counting on you next year and why we treated it for you in the first place. But I'll tell you what, uh, you stick around, you get rehabbed, and uh, we'll, we'll pay your salary. And you just, you know, come back, you know, whenever you can, and we'll be, you know, we'll start all over again. Um, but when all that was happening, you know, during the times afterwards, I just said, you know what? They're not going to go anywhere anytime soon. I mean, the Bears were like 10 years removed from the, the Super Bowl. I mean, it really didn't manifest how good they were until like the 80s started. So I, I knew that, okay, I, I don't want to do this, you know. Yeah. <laughs> to make a long story short, I did some uh, auditions for local television, and I uh, eventually got hired by NBC in New York. One thing led to another. I was pretty good. I got paired with uh, all this these uh, broadcast personnel that the NBC hired. Uh, me and Brian Gumbel did a pregame shows, so... And you I think, had an illustrious career. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, 40 yeah, I, years in? Yeah. I'm, I mean, that's I, amazing. I'm, really, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm the lucky, really, really, really lucky person. I mean, that's why I'm here today, I yeah, guess. Yeah. And, and so 
what was the first sign that neurologically something wasn't quite right? We go back to the late 90s? I think it was at NBC. You had just started with yeah. NBC here in Chicago. Yeah. So it was like January of 1999. Yeah, I was, I was just on the air, and I remember uh, doing an, an, a sportscast. Uh, you know, tonight the Bulls beat the Portland Trail Blazers 97-90. Michael Jordan had 23 points, as, you know. And as that was going on, it was like my brain was in half. The Part of me was saying that, and the other part was, was like this giant tidal wave was just like coming over. And the next thing I knew, I was in my office, and I, I asked some friends, what, what happened out there? I said, they said, what do you mean? I said, well, I looked at my shirt. It was dripping wet, and I said, something happened there. And uh, the day that it happened, we went over to... Correct me if I'm wrong here. Well, Larry Ward, the general manager, yeah. took him from the newscast directly to Northwestern Hospital. And they checked him in for three days of, of neurological testing. And that's when he was diagnosed with epilepsy at that time. And it was Dr. Richard Rovner was the neurologist, luckily, um, who was a specialist with, with epilepsy, who was. And... Um, he was able to identify a lesion on the inner uh, left hemisphere of Mike's brain from the imaging that he attributed to football, mm -hmm. and that was, you know, causing the seizures. And um, were you familiar with the words traumatic brain injury at that point, no. TBI, no. Um, acquired epilepsy, no. any of these things? Um, so you received an epilepsy diagnosis and... Well, you know, the biggest thing was is um, it, it just didn't sound so catastrophic back then, you know. Yeah. So, but th that people always... Here's this group of people that have epilepsy. Now you've got here, here, here. All of these different types of epilepsy yeah, yeah. and different w causes because... We know that epilepsy, in and of itself, is a symptom of something else. It is, right. it is a you know a diagnosis, right. but it is it is caused by another condition, be it genetic or acquired through uh, traumatic brain injuries or the like. And when the doctor you know told us you know he's giving us the results, diagnosing him with with epilepsy that he had had a seizure. That's what he experienced, and that he had through his imaging and tests had been able to identify this le lesion mm -hmm. that he said was due probably to a football in injury. Um, it, that that was that was new information for us because I know you know I knew epilepsy as mostly a condition you were born with. Mm -hmm. and it, it manifested in the grand mal type seizures. So, so this was something new for us, and it was, the first, it was the first piece of information that we had about any type of brain trauma related to football. And what uh, year was this? This was uh, January of 1999. So that was sort of your, your first sign, is that you are... Something is wrong neurologically. You're having seizures. How frequently were you experiencing the seizures? Um, it would vary, I guess, you know. And were you able to get them under control with medications? Or is that still, are you still experiencing breakthrough seizures? I think it was much like anybody's experience with, with epilepsy, trying out different medications, mm -hmm. different dosages. Um, different things that affect it, like sleep yeah. uh, or lack of sleep. Stress. And say stress. So going through all of that, you know, um, uh, we were able to get it um, under control going through that process. He, um, this wasn't the first one. Mike, Mike did, I remember him telling me at the time that he had had a few of these, you know, in the years previous. He didn't know what they were because his are, his are not the grand mal. I think they're called, what, complex partial. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's just like he would phase out. And for him, it felt like, a, like he mentioned a tidal wave or he described it as like a train coming at him. They last, would last a minute or so maybe, you know, the, mm -hmm. the short in duration. And uh, he recalled having that experience um, several times in the years leading up to that that major incident on air, um, 
But with the, you know, the doctors, they were able to get it under control. But in the fall of 2015, Mike started experiencing clusters of seizures again. And they did an, 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 another MRI mm -hmm. uh, in that December and then put him in the hospital for another three-day um, complete evaluation, neurological evaluation, in January of 16. When did you learn that this was very likely well, CTE? We had this you know, three-day examination and make sure that uh, the doctor came out, Dr. Michael Smith, and, he, and this was just to see if, how you were doing with your epilepsy, you know. Yeah. And, and he said, uh, you, you know, it looks like you're doing okay. You know, make sure, you, you know, don't go rogue. And I was going to take your medicine every single day. Don't play Superman or any of that stuff. He said, but we did also find something, uh, symptoms that are concurrent with, you know, CTE, you know. And uh, I said, well, that's, that's kind of funny. That from what I understand is that uh, the only way they can tell that is if in post-mortem. Mm -hmm. I said, well, if, uh, <laughs> if that's the case, if you think I've got something that's, you know, close to being CTL and nobody lives from it, well, I'm going to be, I'll be the first person that lives from it for a while afterwards. I think that's just so symbolic of who Mike is. He's always lived life all out there. He's, I mean, look, he's a little guy, 5'9", you know, he, he was a, a Big Ten All-American and, and, you know, with, and at Northwestern, which is saying a lot, you know, against yeah. big teams like, you know, Ohio State and everything, and went on to play in the pros against the odds when people thought he was too little. And so here he is faced with another life challenge, and he's hitting it head on. And, you know, Mike had done... Is that pun intended? No, no, right? <laughs> 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 There's a trap door. You got to... <laughs> Um, so, so this was, you know, so with, I, I think for Mike, it was to show your life isn't over. Right. You know, Mike, Mike, that's Mike's attitude. You know, he has this zest for life. He's going to show, you know, there's no cure for CTE, but your life isn't over. You can, this is how you live with CTE. Hi, this is Brandon from Citizens United for Research in Epilepsy or CURE. To learn more about advances in our understanding of post-traumatic epilepsy, as well as the exciting new therapies being developed that may one day result in a cure, visit cureepilepsy.org forward slash PTE for more information. Now back to this episode of Seizing Life. Diving a little deeper into CTE, what are those symptoms? Um, it, typically, uh, you know, the, you start with some, uh, some memory issues and it moves into some um, affective issues of um, some depression, there's rage, paranoia, aggression, impulsivity, um, executive functioning is impaired. Executive functioning is your, uh, your ability to initiate, to plan, to organize, and then to execute things. It's Which every, is another it's huge here in issue everything with epilepsy and seizures. Yes. It's a very, yes. very common has there been a correlation? Have there been studies between CTE and epilepsy? They're just really starting to research CTE. And um, so as we're dealing with the epilepsy and looking at it in light of how does this all work together? How does the, there, I don't know of any studies. I, you know, I'm not a medical professional, but I did contact uh, Dr. Chris Nowinski, who's the CEO of the Concussion Legacy Foundation, to ask him, what do we know about the incidents? Of, of epilepsy with this type of acquired brain injury. And he says, I don't know of any, any studies on it. So I don't, I don't know what the statistics are. What I do know is that um, just through our interactions, I'm a part of a, the NFL, uh, it's a private wives group, over 2,500 wives, and, and you know, you know, uh, we women, we network, mm -hmm. and, and, and so we get a lot of good information sharing amongst ourselves. And just a question came up in the past week, whose uh, wife wrote in, whose husband was experiencing some really um, uh, problematic, worrisome behavior. And somebody brought up, is he having seizures? And started a whole thread of discussion. And pe women were talking about their husbands having seizure conditions, or this, this you know, type of uh, uh, what looked like a seizure, but it hadn't been diagnosed. How do you 
raise that awareness so that people can, because you have done an incredible job continuing to live your life, getting out there and, and taking care of your physical health, taking care of your mental health, doing everything that you personally could to live the best life possible for you and your family with CTE. How do you live with it? How do you treat it? How, how have you made the most of your life with this probable diagnosis? We, we have found that uh, things that improve cognitive functioning are, are really, really, really helpful. And there are things that, you would, that are at your disposal anytime you want to turn on the music, like ballroom dancing. You, you forget, first of all, you forget all the stuff that might be happening to you, but you're, it, because you have to memorize, you know, left, click, do, do, mem it's. Well, yeah, so it's, the ballroom dancing is one example of something that that's, we do that's a type of therapy. It's good for the brain. And the reason is, is that um, it has multiple components of what research has shown to be healthy for the brain and things that actually ward off dementia and improve your cognitive functioning. So for ballroom dancing, for instance, you've got the physical part, you know, where you're moving, you're dancing, it's a workout. You know, you watch these pro players when they do Dancing with the Stars, it's a workout. So you get the physical workout. We know that physical exercise is good for the brain. You've got the cognitive part. Your brain is operating on so many levels. You're remembering the step. You're dancing in partnership with somebody. So you're, you're, you're judging leading if you're the guy and how to lead and responding to the woman. The woman is, you know, responding to the man. So your brain is operating on that level. Um, and then you've got the social component. You know, we found socialization, social interaction is crucial to wellness and brain health. So that's firing up the brain on all kinds of ways and you get those endorphins, you know, flooding your brain. And then you add in music. And music is another thing that we know that just gets those synapses firing in all kinds of ways and especially with memory. And they found in studies uh, uh, utilizing dancing and music that if you play music, that is from your era, is when it's especially powerful. Mm -hmm. it, just, it just ignites so many memories and parts of the brain that you know, um, are, are maybe lying dormant. So it gets them all active again. So ballroom dancing is one thing. Exercise and the types of exercise, cognitive stimulation and what that means, uh, social interaction, diet and nutrition, and then positivity and, and, and keeping, um, uh, you know, your hopes alive. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and across all that, of course, is good medical care, overseeing it all. Um, but when you talk about cognitive stimulation, basically what you want to do is engage in new learning. Because when something is easy to you or comfortable, mm -hmm. you're, not, you're not learning. You're not growing the brain. So you want to engage in new things, novel things. So learn a new language. Take up a new hobby. Ballroom dancing, you're constantly challenging yourself. Mm -hmm. um, these are the types of things that really improve cognitive functioning. What we, what our MO was, there's no cure for CTE. We cannot stop the ongoing deterioration of the brain. That's ongoing. But what we can do is encourage neurogenesis. So that's new cell formation. And we can uh, do things that uh, create, uh, exploit the neuroplasticity of the brain. So new pathways where the parts, other parts have been destroyed or memories destroyed, we can create new pathways and that's through experience. So the diet that we did is an anti-inflammatory, so low sugar, low glycemic index, good quality protein, lots of antioxidants, and, uh, and the uh, fatty acids and omegas. So you have blueberries and steel cut oats and broccoli and salmon and olive oil. So we are creating like a toolkit. Yes. You know, there's all, we can't treat it, we can't you know, stop it, but here's what you can do. Um, and, and we have just um, in this past year, uh, the World Health Organization, WHO, came out with their guidelines uh, a whole book where they did um, uh, a meta-analysis of the research out there that um, speaks to um, um, brain health and mild cognitive dysfunction and warding off dementia. But the things that they found, 
uh, that were effective were exactly these things that we're doing. It's the things with exercise, mm -hmm. with, with good diet, with cognitive stimulation and learning, and with social, uh, social interaction, and sleep. Sleep. It's probably Good the number sleep. one thing for everybody. Mm -hmm. that, you know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So you know, this is the other our other message for hope. You know, Mike. This is Mike's lifestyle. This is how he lives his life. And um, but for the people who contact us, we hear from a lot of um, not only the affected men primarily, but a lot of mothers. We just spoke with a mother yesterday, a young man. Her son's in his thirties. Um, wives, we hear from. And not a lot of hope and a lot of despair because the symptoms of CTE are uh, devastating and extreme, um, chaotic, and and it affects the whole family. So they're in, they're they're desperate, and so part of giving hope is here's what you can do. Right. Here are things that can make a difference, and we can support one another. That social interaction is telling your story. Being there for somebody else, joining hands, giving hope to another until they find a cure. And they will find a cure and they will find a treatment. You are like speaking my language verbatim. <laughs> I just, yes, all of that. I, I, I feel all of that to my core. This has been just so incredibly enlightening and I have learned so much from, from both of you and I am so grateful that you came and spoke with us today and shared your story. Um, Mike, Kim, thank you for being here and I wish you both the absolute best in the years to come. Thank you, yeah, Kim. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Kim and Mike, for sharing your story and experiences battling post-traumatic epilepsy and chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Traumatic brain injury resulting in post-traumatic epilepsy, or PTE, is a common cause of epilepsy that can happen to anyone who has experienced brain trauma from an accident or head injury. CURE has a research initiative dedicated to increasing our understanding of post-traumatic epilepsy as a result of traumatic brain injury. For more information, please visit cureepilepsy.org. Thanks so much.